So, uh, welcome back, everybody, uh, to a new session of the Green Stories. And now with the turn of Europe, um, it is a pleasure for me to moderate this panel. We have four very uh, interesting experiences uh, from three different regions and different states of government, and one of them uh, is basically the largest democratic institution we have in the in the continent, uh, which is the European Commission. So I don't want to take uh, much time from our speakers. I'm going to introduce them, and hopefully we will have some time uh, at the end to get some questions from the audience. So um, online we have uh, Nadia from Balmont. She is the product manager of the city of Lucerne. Um, I don't know if she has them online. Hello, Nadia. Can you hear us well? Yeah, it seems so. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm just finishing uh, introducing everyone and then we will start with the presentation. We also have uh, Paolo Rosa, who works at the European Commission. Paolo, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And we also have Sana Godley and Olin Tanum from Digital Lab. Yeah, hi. Uh, actually, Oyerin is not from Digital Lab, but I am. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, and here in the States, uh, we have uh, Pauline Bessel and Virgil Deville sorry, from Open Source Politics. So uh, we will follow the order we have in the program. We will start with Nadia. Uh, he will, uh, she will introduce us uh, the use case of the city of Lucerne in Switzerland. So, Maria, uh, whenever you want. Yes, hello everyone, and thank you a lot for having me. I think I put on my camera also. Now we should be ready. <laughs> um, I can actually hear myself. Maybe can you? Do something about it. Okay, anyway, I start. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm calling from the city of Lucerne. Here on this slide, you can see where we are located in Europe for those who don't know. And we are a rather small city uh, with uh, 82,000 inhabitants and about the same number of people who work in the city. And we, end up, we have a lot of visitors, uh, as you can see on the picture, maybe. And I think the most interesting about the project we started is that we don't have the initiatives in the focus, but other participative uh, spaces. And this is what I will talk about in the next five minutes. Um, an overview about of Decidim. Um, maybe it is important to understand that we are a city administration, but our platform is not only made for us. Uh, I tried to build this in the picture on the right side, where you can see that we are also putting in uh, content in the platform. But we are only one of many organizations who do this. Uh, like we invited the neighboring municipalities to also do it, uh, sport association, cultural associations, other associations, and also uh, institutions who are like commercially active. Like I will shortly explain that the components of how we use the platform. Um, I assume that many of you know about the participatory spaces. That's why I built it like this. Um, first, I start with the assembly. Actually, we use the assembly for all the organizations that I mentioned before who can open up an account and put in any information they want. 
I summarized it uh, shortly here. Like you can see that at the moment we have uh, 21 organizations from the city district who are active, but also invited over 400 other associations to open up a space where they can use all the functionalities uh, who are available in the assembly module. Um, the process as participatory space, we use it for our um, projects. Like at the moment, we have a lot of city projects who are on the platform where people can inform themselves about what the city plans and sometimes uh, participate yeah, like not sometimes, all the time persist, participate, but not in the same uh, depth, maybe. Sometimes it's only a survey and on the other projects, it's uh, also the proposal module. And we are also open for other organizations if they want to have bigger projects that they can also use the process module for their own use. The next part we have on the website is the meetings, where maybe all of you know that you can take them out of uh, the assemblies and the processes. So people will have an overview about everything that is going on in the city. This is from a sports event uh, until an information participatory um, event like everything you can imagine. And something uh, that we think is very interesting is that we want to build some sort of our own uh, social media network, like not social media, but we try to copy the newsfeed function of uh, social media platforms. And we do this by using the block module out of the assembly and the process participatory spaces. At the moment, it looks like this, and we are trying to build um, a page that looks more or less like a newsfeed, uh, as people know it from Facebook and co. And our vision is to someday get independent uh, from using the big platforms. I know it's a big vision, but we try to yeah, go this way. <laughs> um, one thing that I think is maybe interesting to discuss in this round is we in Switzerland, we already have initiatives and consultations. Like it's a thing we have in our direct democracy. And for us, it is rather hard to know how we should start to digitalize this project, not project, this process, because it's already in existing. Like, is it harder to try to put up initiatives digital if you already have a, a way to do it uh, analog? Or should it be easier because we already know the process? In this, With these two um, spaces, we have a lot of questions open. And if everyone, anyone would like to discuss with us, like we, I think we have the possibility here or then get in touch anyway uh, at the email I show here. And at last, I have a short overview because we are not the only ones in Switzerland using Decidim. There are a lot of interesting projects going on. And I also get calls every week from other cities who are interested in what we do. So I think uh, Switzerland is on the go for Decidim. <laughs> Yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you, thank you, Nadia, for the presentation. We hope we have some time at the end to comment on what we said. But now we are going with uh, Paolo, uh, who is presenting how the city has changed in the conference on the future of uh, Europe. Paolo? Yes, thank you. So, just give me uh, one second to set up everything. Sorry, because you already 
seeing the last, the, the end of the presentation. <laughs> So I hope you can see now the see the screen and also the presentation. So I'll start by providing you some, yes. I'll start by providing some context about the the conference itself. Uh, so the conference on the future of Fubric uh, can be seen as a pan European participatory process uh, that is composed by multiple events uh, and uh, it's open to to everyone. So citizens, civil society these stakeholders uh, can go uh, into the digital platform and participate also in the events being organized physically online and share their own ideas. Uh, the conference in itself is a uh, priority from the Commission. Um, this is described in priority number six, a new push for European democracy. And there it's already written uh, that Europeans, uh, European citizens should have a, a greatest say in the future of, uh, of the European Union and should have an active role in setting the priorities. So this is, let's say, the, the ground base for the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, the conference in itself is a joint uh, initiative. So it's, uh, it's, while it's based on the proposal from the Commission, the three institutions, so the Parliament, the Council and the Commission, have the same authority and have to agree in all the formal procedures and on the outcomes of the conference. Um, this is also important because the conference is more than a listening uh, exercise and there is a commitment to, to follow up on the recommendations that came out of the conference, of course, within the sphere and the competence of the, the three institutions. So the conference, oh, let's say, started on the 19th of April with the launch of the online platform. Uh, then there was a formal event on the 9th of May and it's uh, expected uh, to reach conclusions by spring of uh, 2022. Now, the conference in itself is composed by four main components. Uh, I won't go into much detail, but just for you to have an idea of, of the process. Collecting the ideas of citizens, but it's also a place where uh, decentralized events can be announced and they can happen. Then you have uh, four European uh, and four European citizens panels that will meet uh, each three times. And then you have the plenary of the conference. Um, in all of these elements, uh, the only one that has, a, let's say, um, executive uh, decisions is the executive board, and you will be responsible for uh, for the final uh, decisions of the conference. Uh, now. As you must imagine, considering that this is a pan-European uh, exercise and involving the 27 member states, um, the digital platform has a very important role, even more with, uh, with uh, the recent pandemics, with COVID-19. Uh, and the platform is not only a place where all the information about the conference uh, is happening, but is also a place where all the ideas are being collected. And this is done in headline topics. Uh, this being said, uh, there was a, um, in order to, to to have a platform that was uh, adequate to the to the needs uh, and to the requirements of the conference, uh, there was a uh, let's say a, an assessment of potential online platform for this purpose. Uh, we wanted more than a simple website. We wanted to for the citizens to have the possibility to have a true pan-European debate. Uh, and so we, because there wasn't anything available on the commission, we went outside and looked at what was already available. Uh, and we did a market research on, on potential platforms. This was also based on, from a business perspective. So looking at what was there in terms of deliberative potential, uh, in terms of multilingualism, uh, how face-to-face -face interactions can be com combined with online, but also from IT perspective. So in terms of security, data ownership, licensing model, and possible integration with the Commission. Uh, so uh, I think it's obvious that from this analysis, uh, the CDM was a selected platform. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the platform that we are using was customized for our needs. And I wanted to highlight three main features that I consider relevant for the, for the context of the conference. The first one is the multilingualism, uh, the platform all the content of, of the platform is available in the 24 EU languages, and this is done using 
both manual translation and automatic translation. So all official content is manually translated, while the contributions from citizens, so be it in the form of ideas or comments, this is automatically translated using the uh, the commission proprietary tool the translate to. Um, the second aspect that I find relevant is the type of interaction that is possible to happen on the platform. So there are four main ways to, to interact. So citizens can submit their ideas in any of the 24 EU languages. Uh, they can comment on others' ideas. So the idea is to promote a, a debate around the, the ideas that were submitted. Uh, anyone also can organize an event on the platform, be it a citizen, be a civil society organization. So. Uh, this is another aspect. Uh, what is important to mention here is that the events need to comply with the conference uh, charter. And in the end, a report must be produced and uh, it should have a clear list of ideas that came out of this, uh, this event. And the last one is, of course, you can also attend one of the many events that are already happening uh, throughout uh, Europe. And just to give you a few numbers, uh, so at, at the moment we have more or less uh, 8,000 800, 600 ideas. Uh, we have 3,000 events. Uh, so this is to give you a, a picture of what is happening on the conference. Uh, the last element that I, I would like to mention is indeed the, the scale of all of this. We are involving the 27 member states. Uh, there are events happening throughout all of these 27 member states, uh, both official and events organized by third parties. And the events are happening in the 24 EU languages. So I think this is a, an important factor that shows really the endeavor uh, that is behind the conference. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, around 3.5 million unique visitors of the website. Of course, we want to, to have a much higher re reach. And that's why it's also important to advertise even more uh, the platform and the conference. And anyone can go there and have their site. Uh, I'll just finished uh, by saying that we are also committing to have a very transparent process. Uh, we are producing periodic uh, reports. Uh, you can go to the platform. All the all of this is available there and you can look at the information. Uh, so in the sense that you can see what are the ideas being, what are the ideas being discussed. This, uh, these ideas are being uh, analyzed uh, by the Joint Research Center using a, a an automatic uh, analysis tool, but also by an external contractor manually. Uh, so we are creating this cluster of ideas based on the content. You can also see what are the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, what are the topics that are raising more interest from, from citizens. At this moment is European democracy and climate change in the environment, to give you an example. Uh, curiously enough, the topic of health is uh, one of the, is one of, that has the less a uh, number of contributions being in terms of ideas and comments. Uh, but you can also see how different member states are contributing to the conference and what is the, let's say, the social demographics of the, of the participants. Um, so I'll finish here and thank you. Thank you, Now I can do it. <laughs> and thanks again for inviting us to the first. It's always a pleasure. Um, we've been coming four years, four, four years in a row, uh, so it's nice to see everybody. Um, I'm apologizing in advance for the weird accent we've been mixing English and Spanish, and right now I feel like I'm speaking with an Italian accent. So it's, it's, it's kind of weird. So I apologize in advance. Uh, we want to present you what we did with the French Parliament, both the Senate and the National Assembly in France, uh, with uh, the Decision Initiative uh, module. There. Uh, basically, I'm going to give a little context why this slide 
goals. Um, we have the right competition in France uh, that has been uh, in place for many years now. It was uh, an analog right. You have to send uh, a pile of signatures uh, to the National Assembly and then they will compile it and uh, you would basically, uh, there were like almost no petitions that went through and were addressed by the parliament. Um, this right exists from uh, the, the, the 1960s uh, and recently, 2019, there, were, there was a new uh, reglement that say, okay, we are going to digitize this service and um, both the French Senate and the National Assembly has to do it uh, in the in, in the slightly different ways, but uh, almost similar. Um, the basically when they were doing this, uh, when they were told that they had to do this, they were they did the benchmark and they had a, a couple of questions on how they would do it. There was a lot of uh, questions on would it be an internal development? Would it be uh, outsourced to some uh, private company? And you can imagine the lobby. Uh, that change.org, made.org, made so that it could get this uh, visibility. Fortunately for them, this scheme exists and they were able to uh, contract us to do uh, an open source, to use an open source platform to do the petition rights. Uh, but they also benchmarked uh, the one in the UK and the one from the, from the White House. But this one was the, was the one they chose uh, to go with for a number of reasons, because it has uh, more flexibility in terms of how you can configure your rights for petition, um, and, and basically, decision stuff. You, you can have different type of signatures per scope. It's, it's very configurable. Um, so once they decided, it was funny because we had like this talk with the Senate and the, Prem and the National Assembly, and they can't talk together because they are usually, uh, you know, they hate each other. <laughs> so we were thinking, yeah, this city and this city here, and then like they ended up choosing the same solution and trying to work on the roadmap, but we, we were like the middle man, it was kind of weird. So we tried to make like as much in common so it wasn't a nightmare in terms of software uh, building, but the, the challenges were uh, common. Uh, they wanted to um, do something that uh, would use an identification service that would say that we are talking with real people, that we are at least at registered in some French database. Uh, but also they wanted anonymity <laughs> of, the, of, the, of the people who would sign, so you can imagine the mess. Um, and so also that we only have one signature per person on each petition. And uh, because they saw the Brexit example, they wanted to do 200k signatures per hour. Uh, which is uh, also messed up. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we went into uh, Kamikaze mode, and uh, we say, okay, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> We're going to have fun. And then the pandemic hit us, so we had to do this during the COVID, and uh, that entertained us for a while. Uh, so basically, the, the, the most uh, specific thing that there is on this project is the identification system. Uh, where we use a uh, uh, French exception again, uh, the, East, uh, the EDID system in France. It's based basically on the French digital services, so you can log in with your health account, your uh, public pension account, even the postal services. This sends data to some kind of wrapper that says, "Okay, you exist in the in, in the register of the persons in France," and it can send a bunch of data. To, uh, no, no, <laughs> to, uh, to some uh, external application. And basically what we have to do is, uh, in order to ensure anonymity for the signatories, uh, we have uh, to do a separate flow for uh, signatories. So where we, on one side, when you register as someone who wants to sign a petition, uh, you will only get like a unique ID that is randomized every time you log in, I think. Um, so that I cannot connect you with your author account where I need to know if you are presenting a petition to the French Assembly, I need to know who you are. So uh, I would get the name, the surname, the birthday, because only people who are 18 years old can do it, uh, and your email so I can contact you. So that's resulted in a, in a parallel uh, sign of flow where uh, you can, uh, on the website, it says register as a signatory, register 
as an author and it would say this. I was really afraid that it would really mess up with people's head. Uh, it doesn't in the end. Uh, we can thank the developers and the people who work on the project because it's, uh, it's working okay. Uh, so we have also uh, a, a dedicated authorization under for each of the flows, so an authorization under for the people who sign, an authorization under for the people who are authors of petitions, so we can check if you are 18 years old or whatever. Um, and uh, basically, the other challenge was uh, performance issues. As you know, the CDM is not uh, the best student in the class when it comes to performance. Um, and uh, we tried to contact some guy who had a very similar problem. So this guy on the slide is a Rails uh, core uh, developer, but also he did the, the optimization for the UK Parliament website. And it was a nightmare for him too. Um, and he was able to use the Amazon Web Services and we couldn't, so we have more issues than him. But basically he helped us uh, understand, for example, for the UK, they had, uh, on the page, they had a real-time counter. And that's uh, when you had the Brexit petition, it uh, really messes up with the server, so they had to fake uh, um, the, the counter uh, because if they were to calculate it in real time, it would break the application every time there was a big petition coming. So he helped us with a few flows telling us, okay, you should probably do this here, probably do this here. So we can thank him. He did all of this for the cost, so thanks to him. And the other optimization that we had to do, so we had some software things that we did. And we also did with caching and this kind of things. And we also did some horizontal scaling uh, of putting several application servers. So the result is our this two website that you can go visit, petitions.senate.fr, petitions.nationalassembly.fr. And uh, in terms of uh, figures, you know, how successful the project is, well, fortunately enough, it's, it's, a, it's a good success. These are actually the two biggest DCDM instances that there are with real people behind it because we know they are like uh, real citizens or real humans. The National Assembly is uh, 170,000 uh, users. The Senate is 140,000 uh, users. Uh, we have, uh, so I, I told you there was no petition before. Now we have uh, uh, 1,200, uh, around a half a million signature, and also 100 official response. So it's uh, pretty much a success, but now Pauline is going to tell you how it's also a failure. So I'm going to talk about uh, the, um, the, uh, the challenges that in terms of politic, uh, in politics we, face, we have to face because we want uh, citizen voice to be heard a lot more and we have the case with uh, uh, one petition that uh, reached the goal of uh, 100,000 signatures uh, in, in the Senate platform, like a really, uh, with a big communication um, and was for flexibility allowance, and that's a really big deal in France because, like, uh, you can't, um, you can't uh, have the allowance uh, if your if your husband or your wife earns like more than a, a certain. Uh, kind of thing, <laughs> and um, the, the the problem was that okay, it reached the goal, and then uh, it went to the Senate. When they made the bill, and uh, the majority in the in the French Parliament, uh, the French National Assembly, uh, blocked everything because like uh, they didn't. But they said it was too difficult to do technically to. Uh, to do the thing, so um, the, the thing I want to say is it's really cool to have a big petition platform for, for parliaments, but again, and I think it's uh, something we all know, when there's no binding processes, when the institution doesn't want to hear and or doesn't really care, uh, it's my opinion, doesn't really care about what, what people want, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a real problem because uh, it discourages uh, citizens. Like uh, 
we always say in France, like, uh, people doesn't want to participate, they don't care about politics, and that this kind of thing was really interesting for us because we, we really wanted to, to, to do that day. Yeah. Thank you for the I'm sorry that uh, I put you to, to finish, but uh, we're running out of time here. Uh, okay, now we're going to travel north. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We're going to finish with the use case in the Nordics. We're going to see some examples of digital citizen participation in Nordic countries with Sandra Gordy and Oili Vitano. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm just gonna check if we can. Yeah, um, thank you for having us. Uh, I just want to say that there's a bit of an echo, so if it, it can be solved, that's great. Otherwise, I'm just gonna try to compete against my own uh, voice. <laughs> um, so I'm Sana, and I'm from Digitum Lab. We're a democracy lab based in Sweden, and we work with supporting municipalities, not just in Sweden, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, for example, we've been working with the European Commission, so I'm really glad to see Paolo here, and also with the US, together with OSP. Um, but today, I'm here to focus more on the Nordic examples of investing. Um, and later, I'm just I'm, I'm going to focus on a research project that we have, together with a couple of Nordic actors, and also the work that we're doing in um, Helsinki and Sweden. And then Eivin, that represents the in Norway is going to talk about examples from there. So first off, uh, I'm just going to explain a little bit about uh, research projects that we have right now running for three years. It's called Cold Digit, so it stands for Collective Intelligence um, for Digital, uh, digital Tools, uh, basically. And uh, what we're looking at is, is how digital the use of digital tools can in increase collective intelligence, specifically in the Nordic context. And as you know, the Nordic context is a bit different uh, from the rest of the world, as we had a history of a strong welfare state, uh, which had led to, in a way, uh, a, an increased trust. I mean, we don't have the same history as, for example, Spain, with a lot of social movements recently having large distrust against government and doing a lot of uh, bottom-up uh, movements. Uh, but we still have a lot of inequalities in the Nordic. So you can say that for like over 60 years, the welfare state has slowly been eroding a lot in a lot of the Nordic countries. And we can see the effects of that right now. And also we do not have, at least in Sweden, uh, that strong of a culture when it comes to open source tools. Um, so we have a bit of a challenge. And what we're doing in this research project called Digit is that we're exploring a lot of different types of tools and not just uh, Decidim, uh, we're trying to categorize, categorize among about 150 to 300 different types of digital tools and also looking at looking both at case studies, uh, examples of tools, comparisons of tools, different types of tools. So like you can see in the slide, anything from crowdsourcing, AR, AI, e-democracy and e-participation. And we're also testing tools in different pilots in several Nordic countries. And all of this is together with University of Helsinki, Nesta in the UK, uh, the University of Gothenburg, us, and a, a research institute in Norway called Sintef, and then the municipality of Helsinki, Trondheim, and the housing company in Gothenburg. So there's a lot of actors. And really, we really hope that we'll be able to have a lot of interesting results that can contribute to the, the Sidim community as well. And uh, just to give you an example of the type of questions that we're looking at connected to this theme and uh, in these Nordic countries is that you're all probably very familiar with the participatory budget in Helsinki. That is a great example of how a first use of this theme and a first, uh, the first time trying a central PP really led to high participation rates. Uh, but of course, there are a lot of challenges there as well that the university is looking at currently. So, for example, they're doing a lot of evaluations with citizens, civil, civil society, the municipality, decision makers, and also doing a lot of big data analysis of the platform and social media. Um, and what they want to see and what they hope to kind of um, re do research about for the future is, for example, how to increase the number of innovative proposals, because right now a lot of the proposals are very 
similar to things that the municipality is doing anyways, nothing like standing out. So how can we create the innovation of citizens to come up with things that decision makers would never think of? Another thing is how we can build together with civil society, because a lot of uh, civil society groups are kind of um, a bit skeptical against the process because they feel like, like sometimes it's top down and we don't want that feeling. We want to see how we can create more collaborations from bottom up. Also, there's a sense of competition between citizens that I think many of you are familiar with when you participate in budgets, where people feel like this is my proposal uh, and everyone just works individually. So it's the classic challenge of how can you create collaborations online as well as offline? How, we, how can we create stronger communities between citizens uh, so that they can collaborate across uh, their proposals? And also, how can we create more equal participation? patient since it's not equal right now among neighborhoods and these challenges are i would say similar to the ones that we want to work with in sweden uh, so in sweden we have worked for uh, about three years uh, with the housing company in gothenburg and what they've been doing is that they've been using this again for their participatory budget that they're doing with tenants that live in in low-income areas of gothenburg but tenants are able to uh, respond to the housing company's budgets. And a trend that we're seeing right now is that more and more neighborhoods in Gothenburg are, are doing participatory budgets with their tenants and are there we're trying to do more and more. And also that the city of Gothenburg is interested in using the Sedim centrally and providing that support to all the districts in Gothenburg, which is something that we've been recommending for a while. Um, and in these examples that we're looking at for, for the research project, we have similar interests as the ones in uh, Helsinki. We want to see how we can create collaborations between citizens, both online and offline, and how we can connect people together, uh, how we can create more long-term participation so that, it, so that the processes that they do is based on things that the community needs for the future and not just uh, short-term projects, uh, and also how to uh, mainstream the process and increase knowledge among the civil servants uh, internally. Uh, so now, uh, Eivind is going to talk about the Norwegian example. Yes. Really running out of time. We, uh, you have three minutes. I don't know if you can uh, in three minutes make your intervention. Hopefully, yes. Yeah, three minutes it'll be fine. Thank you. So, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Evan. I'm head of Smart City in Trondheim. And in this case, I'm representing the Norwegian Smart City Network. And one of the things we're trying to achieve is to make it easier for other municipalities to increase their competence on digital participation. Uh, and after like doing a lot of research and collaborat uh, collaborating with scientists, we quickly found out that that DESDEM is basically the best solution out there. So what we are trying to do is to provide the technology along with a knowledge and uh, support to Norwegian municipalities. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, during Nordic Edge and Nordic Smart City Conference, we launched a national platform for digital participation. Um, the platform is now used by almost 20 municipalities, but it's available for all 356 municipalities in Norway. And this platform uh, basically has three parts. We have the technology, which is DESDEM, which means that we are setting up DESDEMs for all the municipalities that want to use it. And we are providing the, the technical know-how and actually doing the technical part. So they don't need to care about that part. And then we have a national network of people working with participation in the different municipalities using DESDEM as a platform. And as we are doing processes um, out in the municipalities in Norway, we're also gathering knowledge to create a common knowledge space that we can build on and where we can learn from each other. So right now we have uh, 20 platforms, give or take, set up 
that are different municipalities are using. And the cities here are this is a bit of an old map, so we have more uh, have more cities now. Um, but the, the amount are increasing quite rapidly. And we have gotten a lot of interest since we launched the platform on Nordic Edge. And as one of our uh, collaborators says, most of the people in an organization are not technical people. And this has a lot to do, or a lot to say of how we approach this. So we want to remove as many of the technical barriers as we can so that the municipalities can start with doing the actual participation because that's what we want. We want to have good citizen participation across countries and across cities. Thank you. So yeah, that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you.